Welcome to the weekly sermon podcast for the Wilmington, Ohio Church of Christ. We pray that this message will inspire you and help you grow closer to God in your faith. Be sure to stick around after the message to find out more about how you can take your next best step. Enjoy the message. Have you ever taken a look into our nation at the divides and the issues we are currently dealing with Have you ever thought to yourself, I wish there was something that I could do right now to help solve the issues? What about in our world? As we take a look into the world at what is still going on today in Ukraine, have you thought to yourself, I wish I had what it took right now in my hands to be a part of solving that problem? Let's bring it in closer. What about in our city? Are there things in our city, things that you see, issues circumstances that you wish you could help spark a positive change on. But what if we come in closer now? What about in our homes? What about in our relationships? What about the relationship within your marriage, relationship with your kids? Maybe it's a relationship with a friend, a coworker. I mean, maybe there's been hurt there. Have you ever thought to yourself, I wish I could do something right now to make it better? What about in your heart? Are there things in your heart. Maybe there's hurt there, maybe scars over your heart, a wound that has loomed over your life for years, and you are starting to think, this can never heal. This can never get better. Because what happens is we see such big issues out there in the world today, big issues in our life. We all can think of them. And we start to look at those things sometimes, and then we look at the resources we have in our hands, and we start to think, there is nothing I can ever do to make such a dent in such big issues. The truth is, we all could use God to come through in some big ways in our life. Maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe that's why you're sitting in this room. Maybe that's why you're joining us online. You need God to come through in some big ways in your life. My prayer for you is that by the end of this message, by the end of the service today, you would hear something from God, not from me, from God, and you would begin to know what your next step should be. We are continuing with our series, Meals with Jesus, going through the Gospel of Luke, looking at the times that Jesus had meals with someone or several people, and the teachable moments that come out of that. Now, today we are not just looking at a meal, we are looking at a miracle Jesus does. We are looking at probably one of the largest attendant meals recorded in Scripture. Today we are looking at Jesus feeds thousands of people with just two fish and five loaves of bread. And what's so cool about this story is, outside the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is the only miracle that was recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So today, our text is in in, Luke chapter 9, but we have all of these different perspectives and lenses to look at this story through and try to bring into context what Jesus is trying to teach us here. Now, maybe you're like me. Maybe you grew up in church. I grew up in Sunday school. Hearing this story, probably close to a dozen times growing up in Sunday school, I, I've been there, I've done the flannel graph. You all remember flannel graph, right? That stuff is awesome. That's just a side note. But I've heard the story so many times, but what happens sometimes with these miracles, sometimes I think we can get a little distracted by the miracle itself, distracted by the fact that Jesus was able to feed this many people with two fish and five loaves, that we miss some of the little teachable things leading up to the actual miracle. So today, as we look at this text, we are going to look and see several little teachable moments that pop up through Scripture, through this text, a lot of which is seen through a test that Jesus gives Philip. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 9. We're going to read through this story. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there, or you can. Uh, the Scripture will be on the screen. We're going to read through this story in Luke chapter 9, starting verse 10. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it, and they followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages 
and the countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. Jesus replied to them, you give them something to eat. They answered, we only have five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all of these people to eat. Verse 14, about 5,000 men were there, but he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so and everyone sat down. Verse 16, taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people, and they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of the broken pieces that were left over. To get some more context of what is going on here at the beginning of this story, we're going to read from the Gospel of John. This is John's perspective of what is happening here. So John chapter 6, starting in verse 1, says, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw signs he had performed by healing the sick. Now, we have a picture here. This is what the Sea of Galilee looks like today. I used to think by saying that name, the Sea of Galilee, it makes it sound like some mass body of water, like an ocean-sized body of water. It's actually the size of a really large lake. You can actually stand on one shoreline Look across, you can watch a boat cross to the other side and dock. That's what's happening here. Jesus and his disciples, they have come from this place teaching and healing people, at least Jesus was, and they got on a boat, went to the other side, the crowd seen where they went, followed around on the outside to catch up with them. Verse 3, then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He said this only to test him, for he already knew what he was going to do. Did you notice why the crowd was following Jesus? Why they took off and started following him? It, it wasn't just because of his great teaching. It's not because, because he was starting to develop this relationship with them and they wanted to follow him because of that. No, they followed him because they seen him heal people. They seen him do some great things and they wanted to see more of it. Which leads us to something that I think we all need to remember today. No matter the circumstance, no matter what we came in here with, when you are in the presence of Jesus, amazing things happen. When you are in the presence of Jesus Christ, amazing things happen. Now, theologians have tried to debate and pinpoint for years exactly how many people were at this gathering. About 5,000 men were there, according to Luke chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 14. It said there was about 5,000 men there, but it's important to note in this day and age, the man was considered to be the head of the household. He was the one who had social status. In this day and age, they would only count the men with social status. In this day and age, in order to obtain social status, you had to own land, you had to be married, in some cases you had to have a legacy or a child to carry on the family name. So most theologians believe, by saying there's 5,000 men there, that they're also there with their wives and children. So most theologians say there was over 10,000 people here. I've even read where some think there was, could be north of 15 to 20,000 we don't know for sure we were not there. But whether there was 15, 20, or even 10, like most theologians think, or even if there was just 5,000, the fact that Jesus pulled off this miracle is amazing. Now, we read throughout the Gospels, at times, Jesus, just like most humans, Jesus needs his rest. Jesus is fully God and fully human, so he needs his rest like us. That's what he was doing. The disciples and him they got away on this boat, trying to go to a private place. Jesus needed rest. And in the Gospel of Matthew, we get some insight as to why. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read that he had just learned about the death of John the Baptist. So not only did he need to get away and rest, he was trying to grieve. But the crowds followed him anyways. Now, imagine you're on vacation. Imagine you get to the beach. You pull out your phone to take that perfect Instagram picture that one you have to do to let everyone else know you're on vacation, right? I follow some of you on Instagram, I know. <laughs> and you pull out your phone. You maybe are standing on the beach shoreline, water coming in around your toes, right as you're ready to take that perfect Instagram picture. 10,000 employees show up wanting to talk about work. 
That's what's happening here. Jesus is just trying to get away, rest, and grieve. The crowds follow him anyways. I don't know about you. If I'm on vacation, if I'm trying to get some rest, I want to be left alone. If I'm trying to grieve, I definitely want to be left alone. But the crowds followed him anyways, and Jesus could have just said, hey, I need some time. I need some time. He could have turned them away, but what he does instead, Matthew tells us that he has compassion on them. He chooses to show love. He sees them as being like sheep without a shepherd. In fact, in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13, it says, when Jesus heard about what had happened, this was meaning the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick and began to teach. Now, at some point during this teaching, the disciples had to start thinking, does he realize how late it's getting? The, the text says that evening was approaching, it was getting late, and the disciples had to start thinking, does he realize what time it is? Have you ever been in a sermon where the preacher, don't answer this if this has ever happened here, but have you ever been in a sermon where the preacher just won't land the plane? Don't answer if it's happened here. <laughs> and you're sitting there thinking, come on, make the final point, say the prayer, let's go, I'm hungry, I've got food at home in the crock pot. The disciples were wondering if he realized how late it was getting. Verse 15 of our text in Matthew says, evening was approaching. Evening approached. The disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy themselves some food. That's a reasonable request. That's a really reasonable request. Hey, Jesus, you've been teaching a while now. It's getting late. They're hungry. We're hungry. Can we just wrap this up and go get some dinner? Instead, Jesus turns to Philip and says, Philip, where can we get bread to feed these people? This answer had to kind of shake the disciples a little bit. Because up until now, their routine has always been this. They show up, Jesus teaches, minds are blown, Jesus heals people, bodies are made home, they pack up and they go to the next place. That was the drill, and this was not a part of it. No, Jesus says, hey, where can we get bread to feed these people, Philip? Now, we read earlier in the gospel, Philip is from the town of Bethsaida. This was his hometown, his home turf. If any disciple was the most qualified to know where to go find bread, where to find the best deals, where everything was at in this area, it's Philip. Now, I'm sure Philip by now, his, the gears in his mind had to be turning in overdrive. He's like, Wow, Jesus just asked me this question. There's like uh, 10,000 or so people here. How much do we have in our checking account? <sighs> I'm sorry, Jesus, we, we can't do this. In verse, in verse seven of uh, Joshua chapter six, verse seven, he says this. He replied to Jesus, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each person to have just one bite. That is 200 denarii for every person to just have one bite. I'm sorry, Jesus, we can't do this. This was a test for Philip. A test to see if Philip could see a problem through a spiritual lens of faith. Something Jesus is trying to teach Philip here and what he wants to teach us today is that sometimes practical problems can call for spiritual solutions. Sometimes practical problems can call for spiritual solutions. But the truth is, most of us are just like Philip. When circumstances arise, we see math. We see economics. We see finances. We see where we can or cannot do things with the resources we have in our hands. But the part that amazes me about this story is this was the disciples about second year following Jesus, which means they have seen miracles. They know about turning water into wine. They have seen Jesus heal the leopard. They have seen Jesus overcome a raging sea. They have seen Jesus cast demons out of a man and two pigs. They have seen Jesus raise the widow's son 
back to life during the funeral, they have seen him overcome elements of the natural, elements of the supernatural, and the same guy who has overcome all of these elements is the same guy asking Philip, hey, Philip, where can we get bread to feed these people? Why is this important? Why is this so important? You see, notice, Philip answers the wrong question. Philip answers the wrong question. Jesus asked Philip, where? Philip answers, how? Jesus asked Philip, where can we get bread? Philip answers, how they don't have enough money. Jesus asked Philip, where? Philip answers, how it is impossible. You see, for many of us, what holds our faith back at times is we are so focused on the how instead of the where. When we have things come up in our life, different circumstances, different issues, we get worked up about something, we immediately look to how we can or cannot do something with our efforts, with our resources and our hands, instead of looking to the where it can happen. Jesus asked Philip an impossible question. It seemed like an impossible question. Where? Church this morning, if Jesus asked you an impossible question about where, guess what? He's the where. He's the where it can happen. And if Jesus is the where, he will provide the how. If he is the where, he provides the how. Philip had the situation to figure out, and he was putting his faith into their pocketbooks, into their resources. But the truth is, Jesus was about to be the where and the how these people are fed. Philip had an impossible situation to figure out. And church this morning, what is yours? We all came through these doors with situations in our life, circumstances, issues that we are dealing with. When we look into the world, see the issues there. We look into our nation, we see the issues there. We look into our cities, our homes, and within ourselves, we all are dealing with issues. We all have things in our life that sometimes it might get to the point of feeling like impossible. And the question is, are we looking at the how it can or cannot be resolved with our efforts, or are we looking to the where it can? We can't blame Philip. Philip's Philip's a smart guy. Philip knew that it would take a half a year's wages to feed that many people. Philip is not a bad guy. He's a regular guy. And he gave a regular guy answer. And he's actually correct. Philip is actually correct in the natural. But the truth is, most of us are just like him. When situations come our way, We look at the math. We see where things do add up. We see where things don't add up. We see where things are adding up against us. We see math. Math was one of those subjects in school that I actually felt like I was somewhat good at. I actually enjoyed math growing up. I remember I enjoyed solving the equations until I got to algebra. You all remember algebra, right? That's where they ran out of numbers and started using letters. Then we had to learn about all of these different ways to do the equations, to work out formulas, and uh, we had to learn about variables, and ah, it just got too much for me at that point. But see, Philip has an equation here, and he is using basic math. His equation looks something like this. Circumstance plus my resources equals my results. Circumstance plus my resources equals my results. We can only ever get our results with our efforts. When you leave Jesus out of the equation, our efforts and our results is all you are ever going to achieve because Jesus actually works as a variable. Jesus works in algebra. Here is what our formula should look like. Circumstance plus X. What is X? X is the variable. What is the variable? The variable is Jesus. Circumstance 
plus X, Jesus equals God's results. Jesus is the variable, and the challenge of life is to bring him into the equation through faith. Philip had an equation, but didn't even consider the variable, Jesus. Listen to me, church. Faith that Jesus can do what you cannot will change how you see life from then on. Faith that Jesus can do what you cannot will change how you see life from then on. When you start looking at your problems, at your issues, at your circumstances, when you start looking at those things through a spiritual lens of faith, using the variable Jesus into the equation, it will change how you see life. Now, it's important to note, this does not mean that all because you have enough faith, nothing bad will ever happen. This does not mean if I have enough faith in my life, I will never face anything of trials and tribulations. No, the Bible says we will face trials in this life. It's just the cause of sin. This does not mean if I have enough faith, my will is going to be done. What I want the situation to look like, that's going to be done. No, what this means here is that having faith in this circumstance means that you are trusting God's will to be done in you and through you and through the circumstance. It is about his will and not ours. Remember, if it was up to the disciples' will, they would have done and gone by now. They didn't want to hang around. This miracle wouldn't have happened. It's about his will and not ours. John chapter 6, verse 8. John chapter 6, verse 8. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far would they go among so many? You know, Philip had to be thinking at this point, oh, good job, Andrew. Good job. You brought us a Lunchable snack pack. Thanks. Go grab us several thousand more. We'll be great. No. John chapter 6, verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place, and they sat down. Verse 11, Jesus took the loaves gave thanks, distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. He held the meal in his hands and gave thanks. Now, at one point, whose hands was that meal in? Little boys. Now, whose hands are they in? Jesus. And the hands of the little boy... It was worth one meal. In the hands of Jesus, it was worth more than enough. Whose hands your resources are in will change its worth. Whose hands you place your resources in will change its worth. When I take my time, my talent, my resources, everything that God has gifted me in this life, if I hold those in my hand, they are only worth my efforts. They are only worth so much. But when I take those same things, my time, talent, and resources, I take those and I now place those into the hands of Jesus, the worth of those things immediately increases. I have here, this is an official Major League Baseball. I paid $18.64 for this. In the hands of myself, in the hands of Jacob Laos, this baseball is worth $18.64. It's not bad. But if I was to take the same baseball and I was to now place it into the hands of the New York Yankees, best closing pitcher, Mariano Rivera, in the bottom of the ninth during his last game in 2013, this baseball is now worth $9,225,000. The worth of something depends on whose hands you are placing it in. Church, whose hands are you placing your resources in? In the hands of the little boy, it was worth one meal. In the hands of Jesus, it's now worth how much? It's now worth how much, church? Not just enough. Not just enough. The very last person didn't take the very last bite and say, all gone, we're all full now. No, it was worth more than enough. 
So much there was plenty of leftover. So much Jesus had to remind them, don't let anything be wasted. In verse 12 of our text in John, when they had all had enough to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Do you know what one of my favorite parts about this story is? Jesus is standing on this mountainside by the Sea of Galilee. He has this meal that this little boy offered in his hands. He took the bread, raised it up to heaven, gave thanks, broke it. Then what did he do? Luke tells us he gave it to the disciples to distribute. He let the disciples be a part of distributing the miracle, distributing the blessing to the people. Listen, that is our job as Christians. The Bible says Jesus is the bread of life which was broken for us, and it is up to us. We get to take that bread of life into the world and be a part of the distribution. We get to be a part of the miracle of Jesus Christ. That should get everyone excited. That is our job. That is the blessing we get to be a part of. We get to be a part of that. The disciples, they did not have to worry about rationing. They didn't have to worry about the results. That was up to Jesus. They didn't have to go by tearing off little pieces and saying, here, take small bites, make it last. I hope there's enough. No, there was more than enough. And the disciples, they just had to be obedient and distribute and leave the results up to Jesus. That is our job. We are in charge of the distribution. Jesus is in charge of the results. We are in charge of taking the bread of life into the world, into the streets, into our homes, into everywhere we go. That is our job. And we leave the results up to Jesus. There's something so humbling about having everything you have to offer in your hands, your time, your talent, your resources, taking those and saying, God, they're only worth so much in my hands, but I'm taking those and I'm placing those into yours and I want to be a part of the distribution. Here's some examples. Uh, A couple months ago, during a message, I gave a challenge to our church called the Kingdom Worker Challenge. You might remember I had these envelopes. Inside the envelopes were cards. On the cards were tasks that were designed to help further the kingdom of God and help stretch Christians in growth. And the deal was you could take the card, but if you broke the seal on the card, you were committing to God to do whatever that card said. About 60 cards were taken. I don't know if all of those were completed, We didn't keep track of who took what. That was between you and God. But Revelations 12, 11 says that we win by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And I wanted to hear the wins. I wanted to hear the testimony that came out of that. So several people was able to send me and their stories about what had happened. And some of them gave me permission to use those today, to read those for you. Now, I promised them I would not say their names. That is private. That is between them and God. But they gave me permission to share the stories. Story number one, my kingdom worker card said to walk around town once a week for about 10 weeks and for about a half hour praying over the streets of our city. I was really really hesitant the first week and it felt really weird. It felt like people were staring at me. I got so uncomfortable that I decided that day this challenge was over. The next week, There was something inside of me that kept telling me I needed to walk and pray today. Within the first 10 minutes of my walk, I ran into a lady that I used to work with. I asked her how things have been going. She told me that she was just getting out of a really bad divorce. She said her kids wanted nothing to do with her. I asked her if I could pray for her and she accepted. I decided from that moment on to be upfront about praying for people because deep down, everyone knows they need prayer. And it might just take someone like me walking by to pray for them. I have successfully finished all 10 weeks. 
but the Holy Spirit is probably moving me for round two. Story two, for 12 weeks, I was supposed to find creative ways to bless people around me. I decided the first week to offer to wash my neighbor's car. This was the beginning of March, so he said, if you're crazy enough, go ahead. (laughs) This sparked the idea for me the next few weeks to start washing my coworkers' cars, with their permission, of course, during my lunch break at work. They probably think I'm crazy, but at this point, I'm okay with that. Story three, for the past nine weeks, every other day, I spend 10 minutes in a quiet place just listening to God. The goal is to approach him without an agenda and just listen for him. I have always struggled with patience, and I'm normally an anxious person. It is so easy for me to get worked up over the littlest issues. When I spend 10 minutes in the morning just listening to God, I find that he helps me put my mind at ease, and I am able to approach most of these days without having the feeling of being anxious all the time. I've been doing this for nine weeks now. I was supposed to stop after six. Story four. My husband and I thought that it would be a great idea to do one of these together with our children as a family. Our task was to pick a country and do research on how that country is broken, what social issues they're dealing with, what poverty is like there. For 90 days, we were to pray for that country and the people in it. There is nothing like hearing your I thought I got this out of my system after the first service. There is nothing like hearing your little children pray with such compassion for people on the other side of the world that they have never met. The part that melts my heart as well as my husband's, our kids want to start over with another country as soon as the 90 days are complete. This is people in our church This is people in our congregation, few stories of many, some of which are sitting in this room at this very moment. This is examples of people from our church who says, I understand that my time, my talent, my resources, they are gifts from God. I am no longer holding on to those. I am not trying to solve the world's issues with my efforts alone. I am taking those things. I am placing those into the hands of God Almighty He blesses those and I get to be a part of the distribution. We are in charge of the distribution. He is in charge of results. And who, who whose hands you place your resources in matters. The worth of your resources depends on whose hands you're placing them in. Which leads me to a question for us today, church. Are you being selfish with what God has given you? The things he has placed in your life, your time, talent, resources, the gifts that he has graced you with. Are you holding on to those things, trying to solve issues with your own efforts? And the issues just keep piling up and it feels like it's becoming impossible. And if they haven't yet, they will. Are you holding on to those things, decisions, relationship issues, decisions about your job, about your family? Are you holding on to those things? Or are you saying, I'm placing these in the hands of the Father for Him to bless? The worth of your resources depends on whose hands you place them in. We hope you have enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, talk to, or maybe you just want more information about our church, be sure to fill out a connect card so we can reach out and help you take your next best step. Thanks again for joining, and we will see you back here next time.